uh, hello, uh, Mr. Moore, or uh, would you like uh, Alexander? Alex is fine. Alex is fine. Thank you, Alex. Thank, thank you for uh, accepting our invitation. Uh, Dr. Alexander Moore is a climate and health scientist. He's associate professor of environmental health at LIU and NYC and assistant research professor at the Climate Change Institute and group leader at F Harvard University. You've been covered by CNN, Washington Post, The New York Times. Uh, I've seen your work lately on TV because uh, you've, you've been making waves with um, how you put the pandemic and uh, the rising temperatures together. How did you do it? How does it work? Well, the uh, best way to uh, learn about our current crisis and the future, what the future has in store for us is to look at past uh, crises uh, that were even uh, similar. And of course, nothing uh, like the current climate crisis has ever occurred in uh, human history. Uh, we have warmed the planet in the last uh, century uh, more than um, any other time when humans were alive. But uh, we wanted to see, I wanted to see what uh, climate uh, impact uh, there was during the last great pandemic, the Spanish flu, uh, which occurred uh, in 1918 to 1920, uh, so exactly a century ago. And no one knew, and nobody is, in the, the research exist, that, that existed until I published my article uh, did not discuss, uh, really did not look into uh, what the environmental conditions were uh, during the pandemic. And uh, we know from recent research that every time there has been a uh, climate crisis, it was followed, it is followed by a health crisis as well, often in the form of a pandemic. So I wanted to explore that. I wanted to see what the climate, what role the climate played during the last pandemic so that we may understand what role the climate plays in the current pandemic and future pandemics. And uh, I did that by uh, using the highest resolution climate record on the planet produced at the Climate Change Institute at the University of Maine, where I'm affiliated, as well as um, health data, that is how many people died and how many people were infected during the pandemic in 13 different countries in Europe. Uh, uh, that data about mortality, about how many people died, how many people were sick, was never actually published, uh, even after a century. It exists, uh, it's published in print, but it was never published in a scientific journal uh, in a way that people can actually download the data and do whatever they want with it. So I actually had to translate it and transcribe it and add it up from 13 different governments, 13 different uh, record keepers, and then add up all the numbers. How many people died? When did they die? What week of the year? Uh, and what was going on in Europe during that uh, period? What was the weather doing? I saw a correspondence between uh, the an increase in rain and an increase in mortality, particularly during the uh, most uh, deadly wave of the Spanish flu pandemic, which occurred in October uh, and November and December of 1918. Uh, which showed uh, a, rem a remarkable increase in uh, in rain. Rain goes together with the pandemic. That's interesting. Definitely, the two were correlated. Uh, it is uh, the, the precise mechanism. Uh, we po we we hypothesized that the the mechanism was that uh, a climate anomaly uh, that was over Europe for five years during the World War One. Actually started in 1914 and continued until 1920. Uh, this actually six years, excuse me, uh, a climate anomaly that brought cold uh, and uh, wet uh, weather for uh, extended period of time actually affected the migration of animals, uh, particularly birds that carry the Spanish flu. It's a, it's a, the, the flu is an H1N1 avian flu virus, uh, which um, is transmitted to, from birds to humans and other animals, uh, usually by contaminating the water in which birds uh, live. Uh, so uh, we uh, isolated ma mallard ducks, uh, the, the, uh, species of duck that's very common in Europe as well as in the United States, 
as one of the carriers, and we also looked at uh, uh, migration patterns of, of these birds and how they, are, when they're disrupted, these migration patterns either due to um, a, a strong uh, climate anomaly like this one or other artificial, uh, you know, human uh, changes like the World War. Uh, what happens to the, the to these birds, these animals, these birds, and they tend to stay exactly where they are. They also, um, uh, so they don't migrate anymore, and uh, they also reach about 60% infection rate in, just in the fall, September, October, November. Uh, so the, the birds actually increase their infection rate uh, over uh, the fall or autumn, autumn period, and that's exactly when we see uh, an increase in pandemic deaths uh, from the Spanish flu. So what we think it happened, what we hypothesized, of course, there's no way to track it exactly, but what we hypothesized based on other studies is that um, the climate anomaly, uh, the six year climate anomaly that lasted, uh, that, that was over Europe and affected all of Europe for that long, as far as uh, Turkey, so from Turkey to Spain, as no far north as Britain, uh, actually interrupted migrations. Uh, these animals uh, uh, contracted, uh, actually became more and more infected over the autumn. Just because they didn't migrate. So they got more infected because they just uh, uh, sit. Always get more infected in the fall, in the autumn, because uh, the, the, that's when chicks are uh, reached that level of infection. Chicks uh, have been around, the young little uh, ducks have been around for less time than the adults, so they're more vulnerable. And the bottom line is the birds didn't migrate, they contaminated water. The water was, uh, you know, rivers and lakes were overflowing due to the climate anomaly. So the contaminated water got into the trenches where soldiers were. Uh, if you see photos of World Fantastic. War One, uh, you can see uh, that throughout the World War One, you see um, uh, soldiers always with their feet and uh, and sometimes their whole legs in water, sometimes their water up to their neck, sometimes they actually sleep in water. Uh, and you also see um, the entire landscape, um, puddles of water everywhere due to bombing uh, that created, that cratered the earth. And then those craters would fill up with water. And interestingly, toward the end of our study, we actually uh, figured out, uh, this is not in the study itself, but it is in our interviews uh, with Paul Majewski at the Climate Change Institute at the University of Maine, the director uh, and I discussed what could have caused the climate anomaly. And uh, interestingly, uh, when there is a lot of dust in the air, when the air in the atmosphere is saturated with dust, uh, you have a higher likelihood, a li higher chance um, that oh, there will be a rain, and exactly. uh, the dust and, and the dust that we uh, um, we we posited, uh, Paul and I discussed this, and and you know we we were wondering why why was there this climate anomaly? Was it natural? Was it uh, uh, man made? And the answer that we came up with was bombing of Europe during <laughs> World War One which uh, uh, was the first time that, um, uh, air, you know, airplane bombing of the entire continent occurred on a large scale. And you can still see the craters in, uh, in Europe if you go to look at Belgium or... Of course, everywhere. Even Romania is filled with craters and uh, places where we had bombs. So what you're actually telling me, we had bombing and then there was the dust. Yeah. The dust rose, we got heavy rain for an extended period of time, too much rain, um, the migration didn't happen for, uh, for the ducks, and then we had uh, H1N1, which is uh, the Spanish flu. Right, and I mean, it's not a one-to-one -one cause and effect, of course, because there are multiple factors at play. Uh, you know, many, many people in trenches, millions of people in trenches, uh, lack of hygiene, uh, the of exposure. Uh, to other diseases, many people who got the the flu didn't actually die of the flu. They died of a uh, uh, other diseases they got at the same time as the flu, uh, so called okay. comorbidity, uh, usually pneumococcal infections, uh, bacterial infections of the lungs. So all of these things uh, contributed, but the you can't deny the correspondence between the European deaths that spike twice 
in uh, October, November of uh, 1918, and the rain, which also spikes twice, uh, goes up twice uh, in a very uh, clear pattern that at the same exact time. That is uh, just a, a smoking gun. It's, it's very easily uh, identified. Unfortunately, to create to do studies like this, you have to have um, expertise in many disciplines and many languages, and uh, that's one of the strengths of our group. But also, that's why we are one of very few who do this type of work. Uh, we have a uh, uh, climate scientist, glaciologist, hydrologist, historian. Uh, archaeologists and uh, uh, several other uh, experts on our team. So you're, you're actually a climate scientist and you're focused on health, which is very important because... I was trained as a climate and health historian and uh, scientist as in my postdoc, yes. So what you're actually doing is not just putting theories out there. You're not a, a science fiction writer. You're a scientist. What you're saying sounds like a theory because, oh, it was the birds, it was the ducks. No, some, some people might just say, look, there's the new hoax about the ducks that infected the troops and the ducks didn't migrate because of the bombs. And it, is it that easy to change climate? Actually, it's a lot easier than we think. Um, a good example uh, is, for example, uh, comes from uh, Christopher Columbus, who landed on an island, his name now, I forget, in the middle of uh, the Atlantic. Elena? And, uh, uh, no, I don't think uh, Elena. Uh, it, it was in the West Indies, I believe. And what he, he, his son actually writes in the journal uh, that they found the climate of the as many new col colonists to these new lands found the climate uh, too wet, and they cut all the trees to change the climate. People knew that if you cut cut the trees down, you're going to change the climate of uh, an area, and that's exactly what they did. Um, that's exactly also what uh, people did in North America when they first landed. They found the climate to be uh, hostile, uh, not pleasant to European uh, temperate uh, habits. And so they, they, they tried to reform, uh, change, really terraform the earth, uh, the, the, the uh, area with their uh, action. Uh, to answer your question about theories, Science is based on the best knowledge we have at any given time. Uh, we, in, in my article, we cite multiple uh, studies um, that prove that uh, the interruption of migration of uh, 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 birds, uh, particularly the species that I mentioned, is very easily achieved uh, simply uh, with a climate anomaly or with uh, some artificial uh, human intervention. Um, so there are three or four different articles that have proven that uh, all throughout Europe in different areas. And we have also shown um, the, the public health data, the mortality and, and, and you know, how many people died, how many people were sick. That's, that's just government data. So I, I'm not making up anything. You can find it, it's cited. And the climate data is the highest resolution climate data on the planet. The, the putting it together, uh, um, you know, uh, into this uh, uh, scenario, uh, you may uh, you may have your doubts, and that's uh, that's what science is about. It, it's testing hypothesis, and if you if you don't believe it, you're free to do so. However, uh, no one has produced a better uh, description with higher resolution data um, and that that fits together this well uh, about how the pandemic came came forth. Um, we really just put the pieces together. So that's 103 years ago, basically. And we, we actually needed a century, a full century to realize that. How long uh, would it take for us to understand what's happening to us now? I asked the question, this question many times. Uh, if it took us a century to actually figure out what the climate impact on uh, the lar last, last greatest pandemic, uh, and, and the lar largest, uh, the Spanish flu was the largest by number of dead, 50 million dead. Uh, it was uh, the largest by number of infected, 500 million infected. That was one third of the world population. That's just what we know about. Uh, we probably, many think that, that the entire population of the world was infected. That was 1.5 billion. So I often wonder whether uh, 
you know, I, I wonder exactly about the same thing you just asked. How do we know what's happening now? How climate is affecting uh, things now? Um, and is it affecting uh, uh, disease? And, and it is because there are migrations around us all the time. Diseases, all, all, almost all pandemics we've had, we've experienced in the last uh, century and before have come from animals, right? From animals carrying a disease of some kind. And that disease jumping to humans, either directly or from uh, a, the bite of a mosquito or the bite of a flea or the bite of a tick. And those, so insects and arthropods. And um, as we, as climate changes, these animals that carry their own diseases, uh, which we haven't been exposed to, these animals migrate. Just like us, if we don't have water or food, we migrate into a region that has water and food. Like uh, the people in Northern Africa, they are migrating to Europe now. It's really naive uh, of us to think that, um, uh, that animals will not migrate and they will not bring their diseases with, us, with, with them and, and that they, they then will infect us with, with them uh, just by contaminating water or by, again, uh, um, tick, uh... While you prepare your slide and what you're going to show, uh, I have a simple basic questions. Uh, most of the time we lately hear about the new variants, the new COVID variants, and we've been hearing about the Kent version and now the Delta versions, which are so bad. And it, it always amazes me for the, for the past two variants, uh, the officials uh, came out and said, the first person we got into the hospital and we, uh, we tested positive for the new variant didn't come in contact with any person traveling abroad. And that makes you wonder how did that person in a, in a rural area, area, in a village, came in contact with a variant that was so widespread in India? How, does it, how do people in Romania get in contact with the, uh, with the virus over there? And that virus is now worldwide. And I'm not sure Indians have traveled everywhere. When we talk about variants, we talk about mutation. Um, even, you know, the word double variant, uh, or that's, that's a really uh, poor, poor description. Anytime a virus enters a human or an animal, it starts mu mutating and it creates okay. all sorts of uh, variations. Some of them are more deadly, some of them are less deadly, some of them are the same. Um, some of them can be transmitted, some of them cannot. And so the when we describe the new variants, what we're describing is the, what the, the variants, the mutations that have been successful at becoming more deadly or that become or becoming more infectious that is they can be transmitted more easily um that doesn't mean that they're only they're the only variants there are millions of variants billions of variants at any given time so how do these strains actually get uh transmitted uh i think that we have way too uh, much uh, uh faith in how uh, we are controlling borders. I think people are moving, uh, nonetheless, uh, through through the world. Uh, it's way too easy to do so, and um, so I can't I can't explain how uh, the Delta variant or an Indian variant or a South African variant makes its way to Romania if the uh, borders are closed. And uh, but I I um, you know as I said, this is a much more um, leaky uh, ship. It's a much more uh, uh, difficult system to control than we think, uh, than, than we expect. We, we cannot stop it. We, we can just slow it down. We That's can slow the it down and truth. we can vaccinate against it. So I was, I was, as I was mentioning, our diseases are related to climate. What you're seeing here is uh, an animation uh, of uh, uh, migration. The blue are birds, the uh, pink are mammals and the yellow are reptiles through the northeastern United States. Uh, this is for uh, South South America. I haven't prepared uh, Europe, but you can imagine that uh, uh, I actually don't think that Europe exists in this type of animation. It's by the Nature Conservancy and the credit should go to them. Um, 
But you can see how these migrations are constantly happening. We read about them, we listen to them, uh, listen to uh, nature documentaries that talk about this all the time, but we somehow think that it doesn't affect us, that it's not happening around us. But as climate changes, these migrations are going to change as well. And as we, for example, in the in South America, remove a lot of the uh, environment in which these animals live, uh, particularly the rainforest, which has been uh, is is being cleared uh, in order to make way for soy uh, and other uh, cultivations, other agriculture that then grows beef, which is the worst possible food in terms of climate because it has incredible, incredibly high carbon footprint. As you remove the trees, as you remove the habitat, the animals are forced into narrower and narrower, smaller and smaller spaces, narrower uh, uh, you know, zones, and they will end up in our uh, urban spaces, in our human spaces. They will in start infecting our uh, water supply if they infect, if, they, if our water supply isn't uh, um, sealed, if it isn't isolated. It is most most people in the world don't have uh, clean water of access. I don't know if you know this, but in Romania we're so lucky to have uh, the largest uh, population of bears. So we're lucky to have bears, but we, we might we might actually be one of the last countries uh, in Europe to actually have bears. But we have so many now that people say that bears are coming into our villages and attacking our animals and. I've been talking to some, an, an, an elder, an, an older person, and they keep uh, saying that it's not the bears coming into our villages, it's us going into their realm, into their forest, uh, in, onto their uh, place. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is happening everywhere. Uh, we, because of, you know, most of us only live 60, 70, 80 years, and our memory really doesn't go back that far uh you know most people have a hard time remembering on what what happened 20 years ago we don't realize how much we have changed the environment how much we've changed the space around us and uh just simply building a road or simply building a few houses in a in a in an area that used to be a forest or a, a woodland will change the 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 behavior of the animals that used to be there uh, animals expect and are very faithful to the places they live in, right? Uh, you can see a bird returning to the same nest every year, even though they migrate all the way north of the Arctic and come back. Uh, they will come back to the same exact nest every year, exactly in the same spot in your hometown. And many other uh, animals have the same faith, the same loyalty to those areas. So when we change the, the, the landscape, we develop it, we put cement where there were trees, we put roads where in the middle of uh, a forest so that animals have to cross them. Um, we put even industrial farming in, or in the, uh, you know, uh, cattle uh, or domesticated animals in those areas. Uh, the wildlife will uh, want to return to those areas and when they, you know, whatever they find, they're going to adapt just like we adapt. That's what, uh, what the evolution is, it's adaptation to change. So um, it, your, your friend, your elder uh, is right. We have uh, really encroached, uh, really gone into their space and, and, all, and changed it. But we've also done so without development, without cement, without roads. We have done that by simply changing the climate and making it rain less or making uh, weather uh, events more extreme. For example, the tornado in Czechoslovakia that uh, killed a, a lot of people, and you know that's an extreme weather event. Uh, very hard to understand how you can get a tornado of 240 kilometers per hour in in the Czech Republic. So that's real close to us, and it's not near any oceans. It's not ocean. Uh, it's, it's not tornado country there. Right. So first of all, uh, tornadoes are often not near oceans. So Tornado Alley, for example, as it's known in the United States, it, uh, is in the middle in the Midwest. And so, you know, okay. uh, Illinois, Missouri, Kansas, Arkansas, that area, uh, all the way to Oklahoma, sometimes Texas. Um, so it doesn't have to be near the ocean. What near the ocean, you get hurricanes 
And in the Mediterranean, you have had, uh, we have had more hurricanes than ever on uh, record. They're called medicanes. Uh, uh, they're being dubbed medicanes. And those are also completely anomalous. They, they don't happen. Uh, you don't have hurricanes in the Mediterranean. It's just a once in a, uh, century occasionally, uh, there is a freak, uh, event, uh, like that. But we know that uh, there have been several, I, I forget the number, but it was uh, five or six in uh, recent years. Uh, and that's definitely due to climate change, particularly the evaporation of uh, ocean air. Uh, the air that sits right on top of the sea uh, is warmed up by the sea itself. It rises very fast, uh, it creates a low pressure uh, area that creates a convection and that creates a hurricane. It's basically uh, how hurricanes are, are formed. And this is usually, uh, um, you know, a phenomenon that we observe in West Africa, and then you know the the tropical storms make it across um, to North America uh, in hurricane season, uh, which is coming up. Uh, last year was the worst hurricane season on record, with I think seven, 21 named storm. I again, I don't recall exactly the number, but it was the we, we ran out of names for them. And it's happening also in the Mediterranean. We have medicanes. Uh, tornadoes um, can can also be affected by, uh, by climate change. What we have to understand in terms of climate change, it's not just warming. Uh, if you want one word uh, to describe climate change, it's instability. And uh, I like the word, uh, which I guess I coined because it's uh, too odd, uh, extremification. If you have... Uh, certain uh, weather patterns, you're going to have more extreme uh, events. They might be rarer, uh, but certainly more extreme events of the same type. So for example, in my, in, with my group, we published an article in 2019 where we show that Saharan dust storms uh, from the Sahara north uh, that, that go north to Europe uh, are going to be fewer, but more intense. I remember we, we used to get uh, the, um, the dust, the, the, uh, the dust uh, uh, much more often in the past years, but not for the past two or three years, uh, much less. But now the weather is becoming more and more unstable, like you're saying. So I'm going to bring it, uh, this to a, a little more local level so people can understand. So uh, uh, we are in, uh, in July now when we record this. It's uh, July 1st, but June has been one of the rainiest uh, months in uh, recent history. We've been having rain almost every single day. And not just any rain. We had storms and thunderstorms and uh, it was pouring. So it's not common for our area to have uh, such a hot and humid uh, month of June. And um, it's becoming tropical. The feeling is like you're in the islands and it's tropical. And I just got a bug bite I never got before. And it's the size of, of this, of a, of a tennis ball on my, on my foot. Uh, from I, I, I'm guessing it's a spider. And it's itching and it's purple. And I never got this before and I'm 40. So uh, people are getting bitten by all kinds of new insects or the same insects are becoming more and more, let's say their venom is becoming much, much more, let's say, intense. I don't know how to say this. What, what's happening is, yes, the uh, environment is changing. And as the environment changes, exactly what I described happens. That is that animals move, right? So a good example of this is um, the mosquitoes that carry Zika, Zika virus, which causes babies to be born with a smaller head, microcephaly, uh, or dengue fever, which is a hemorrhagic fever, uh, and also uh, chikungunya, uh, which is another uh, disease, viral uh, disease. The mosquitoes that carry these diseases uh, are uh, usually tropical mosquitoes. They are from the tropical areas, Caribbean usually. Uh, and also Southeast Asia. But now the, their habitat, because of the changes you just described, that you described as tropical, I would describe simply uh, a warming, more humid uh, uh, um, pattern of uh, climate that is reaching farther and farther north, right? Because it's reaching farther and farther north, the mosquitoes can also reach farther and farther north. And so what you're seeing is mosquitoes and diseases 
reaching uh, areas that were not uh, originally affected by this. The same can be said, for example, for ticks. Um, ticks used to be a fairly localized phenomenon. Uh, they used to be killed during winter. The larvae, the babies of the ticks, would be killed by very severe winters. If you have a long freeze, uh, you have ticks uh, dying. But unfortunately, uh, with the warming of the climate, we've actually essentially doubled the length of the summer. Uh, summer used to be from May until September, uh, more or less. Now it really goes from April until November. And uh, exactly. as, a, as a result, the ticks can reproduce more and for, for longer and produce more, more of them, uh, reproduce more of themselves. And then we have very mild winters where we don't have strong freezes, or if we do, they don't last very long. So we have a, a short freeze, but it's not enough to kill the, the, the baby ticks, the, the larvae. And so next year, a, a much larger number of ticks. And at the same time, we, especially in North, in North America, we removed all the wolves, we removed all the top predators. So there are lots of deers, uh, lots of deer all over uh, the Northern United States. And ticks love deer and moose. And that's, that's what they eat, uh, that, that they suck their blood constantly. So we have basically provided them uh, uh, double the time to reproduce. We have provided them infinite food and uh, uh, milder climate. And that's what we're seeing in terms of disease. Lyme disease is uh, skyrocketing. Uh, it's really, I'll show you this, uh, this uh, map. Here is a map that I created for North America, which shows uh, climate anomaly and climate reanalyzer. So this is uh, uh, 2017, which is where I had uh, data for how many Lyme disease cases we had. And uh, I compare 2017 to only two decades, three decades earlier, right? 1979 to 1989, the average temperature. So what you see here is how much hotter 2017 was compared to 30 years earlier. Uh, and you can see where it, it has been hotter, right? The Northeastern United States. And we can do this for Europe if you like as well. And now look at where the Lyme disease cases emerge. No surprises. But the, that's also the area that's most uh, populated by humans, too. So No, you would get it in the southern United States, you would get it in the northwestern okay. United States. Uh, no, it's where, uh, where the ticks were originally, uh, okay. where Lyme disease was originally, and also where deer population are, uh, populations are uh, rising the most. Uh, I mean, deer in New York State, for example, are as e equal to rats in terms of how many there are, and, and you know how really? damaging how damaging they are to people's houses. They have to have really tall fences, uh, you know, about eight nine meters tall, because these things, deer can really jump really high. Uh, it's almost like I am legend uh, in the movie when uh, uh, he goes around the city to hunt for deer. <laughs> That's really what, what we're describing, and uh, that's how climate and health are connected. Uh, the vectors of the diseases, the carriers of the diseases, whether they're animals or, or in, insects, uh, are spreading to areas that didn't used to have them, where we are, because of climate, because the climate is becoming more pleasant for them in those areas, more uh, appropriate for them. And because the original habitats they had where they lived uh, has, have become too dry or food has disappeared or too hot even. Um, and so they migrate to be where they want to be, uh, where of course. The, the temperature uh, is most. I mean, most animals are very sensitive to temperature, not only in the, uh, on Earth, also in the ocean. Uh, in the ocean, most animals uh, in the deep ocean have, have uh, d evolved within a plus or minus one degree Celsius uh, uh, temperature change. And if you change that temperature as we are, we're changing the temperature of the ocean uh, uh, remarkably, um, then those animals are also going to, to move and they're, or they're going to die entirely. People don't uh, 
think too much of this, of this but uh, I don't know if you noticed, when you take a shower, a normal person, when they take a shower, uh, the range of uh, hot water to have a, a good shower is from 37 to 39. So if, if I'm going to push the water into 39, you're going to feel the heat, you're going to feel like uh, uh, you're getting a burn from, from the hot water. So if I'm going into 37, it's going to feel like a cool shower. So it's only 2 degrees for a person. This is why most of the time now we, we are living indoor. So people are staying inside their houses using uh, uh, climate control like HVAC and all that. So we think we, we got it under control because we just can turn on the AC. And that's obviously uh, not good enough. What are you showing me now? Uh, uh, now I'm showing you how uh, the, where mosquitoes used to be and where mosquitoes are now. And this is just a change in the last 20 years or so. And the data is from the Centers for no Disease way. Control. Yep. So, you know, this was distribution of uh, Aedes albopictus, which is one of the two mosquitoes that carry Zika, dengue fever, and chikungunya. And this is, and the redder is uh, Aedes aegypti, which also carries those diseases. And now they reach all the way to Massachusetts. They reach all the way to New York uh, and even Maine. Uh, so we are having ticks coming down and mosquitoes going up. Uh, which is really remarkable, uh, a remarkable change we have seen uh, in, the, uh, in the environment. That's science right there. So let's start from that. And I'm I'd like to talk to you and address a few of the issues people might have with uh, climate change. Because we've been talking uh, a few years back when we met and you've, you told me that people don't see the urgency. And uh, it's not okay to scare people because they would just freeze and do, uh, don't do anything about it. There's some people that say, and I'm going to go through, uh, through a few hoaxes, that uh, some people say that the scientific community is not in consensus about climate change. Is that true? Are there any scientists that object to, clim uh, to climate change? Well, it depends on what you mean by scientists. There are some people who have uh, joined uh, a couple of institutes, I'm not going to name them, uh, but that essentially uh, have provided these, the, uh, I don't even want to say skeptical, but uh, much um, skewed, reinterpreted, misinterpreted uh, image of the science okay. that, that of climate change and there are fewer than two percent uh i mean we have been polled uh climate scientists uh have been polled have been uh surveyed by many different uh, uh independent uh, institutions including the united nations and the international panel of climate change but also just independent uh, j journalists and, and newspapers and, and independent foundations. And the number remains the same. 98% uh, of scientists uh, believe, there is no word believe, uh, interpret the science as uh, uh, man-made climate change is happening and it is a crisis and it has never been uh, this uh, extreme uh, in human uh, history. That's, that's just... Uh... Just is. And it's not uh, only according to US scientists, it's uh, according to the entire global uh, scientific community, isn't it? Perhaps one of the misrepresentations or, as you were saying, you know, one of the uh, uh, flaws in the way that we talk about climate change and we talk about warming and even diseases associated with it is the fact that because the way we receive inf this information is through media and because media uh, often is looking for the sensational story, right? Uh, if I tell you, uh, well, this is a one in a century uh, event and, and you know, it, it does show that uh, what we predicted, uh, it falls into a pattern. That doesn't sound ex exceptional. It doesn't sound sensational. It sounds like I'm, telling you science. I'm telling you that this falls into a pattern that we should be concerned, that we should do something about it. But, uh, you know, newspapers don't do that. The newspapers say climate change caused a tornado in, in, in Czechoslovakia, and uh, this is uh, absolutely terrible, and we're going to all have an apocalypse in 10, 10 years. Uh, because that's how people read, right? That's what people pay attention to. We're, everybody's competing for very few seconds of attention from the public. 
And uh, that's the problem because if we start simplifying things too much, um, if we start um, going into the gray area of the way that we're saying it, it's more sensational, but it's still accurate. And, uh, you know, we create a, a, cl a climate of fear as well as other things. Of course. And um, that constant fear, uh, you know, people don't react well to it, particularly if they don't feel like they have power over it. Most people are worried about their immediate uh, needs uh, in life, how to pay rent, how to, pay, how to put food on the table, how to support their children, how to protect their families, uh, and how to you know, retire and have good health. That's what people care about, health, wealth, uh, and their family. And if you are constantly threatening that by saying, uh, you know, this, this catastrophe is going to happen, this other catastrophe is going to happen, in a in a daily uh, on a daily uh, basis, uh, people are just going to tune out. Uh, just, just they're going to tune out. You can see this with the pandemic, right? People started using masks, then they stopped u using masks. They're tired of masks. Uh, they they started you know being distant, and then uh, they we tried to reopen three or four times because uh, people were just tired. They wanted to make uh, to, to return to normal. Uh, nobody wants to live in a in a house on fire all the time. But we, I've been talking to new, neuroscientists, people that are passionate about this, and they've been telling me that uh, people are we are programmed to react in front of immediate danger. So if we see the tiger uh, charging, uh, lashing onto us, we're gonna do something about it immediately. If we see a gun, if we see an animal, we're gonna do something about it. Climate change is not immediate. That's the problem with it. Not in most cases, no. And that's why I focus in my research on long periods of time. So as I was saying earlier, most people have a memory of only yesterday or today, and that's the immediate, right? That's the immediate threat. That's the immediate that we can make sense of in our heads. Uh, no one looks at the, uh, at the uh, change over time in 100 years or 500 years. And that really can only be done with data and graphs and pictures of of change and uh one of the greatest challenges in my in my uh work is to take very complex data that you know for 500 a thousand years and show people how that is an immediate danger right how uh to show people essentially that we are at the tip of uh, of a very long uh, increase, and how is that uh, going to affect uh, them in the future? That's a difficult thing to show. Uh, not everybody likes graphs. How can you make graphs much more important? Uh, if they're not scary enough, people will not pay attention because because we don't like graphs. People don't like graphs uh, unless uh, it's uh, uh, the profit on their stock, maybe. <laughs> Right, right. Uh, so here's, I, I, I don't know, honestly, how to do this very, I mean, all I can really do is uh, uh, show people uh, data and make it pretty. Uh, I can also show pictures of what this looks like, uh, of what we're talking about. I can show you one, um, uh, one graph that, so this is temperature uh, from, the, from Europe. This is from the highest resolution climate record in Europe. Uh, and so here, here you can see what we've all lived through essentially, which is temperature between 1960 and 2016, which is 2013 actually is uh, where this ends. Okay. So we've really only experienced this, uh, but if, uh, but really the full picture is this for the last, uh, uh 500 years only, it goes even uh, lower, uh, if we go back further so we are here but all that we're seeing in our lives in our experience is this yes right and so that's a problem um i'm gonna make a, a an odd comparison here how do you cook a lobster most people uh drop them in boiling water and the lobster screams because the change between uh room temperature and the boiling water is extreme and you know the lobster uh just uh, uh, complains obviously and then dies takes a while 
tries to get out. It's really gruesome. Um, well, we in, instead of that, uh, the proper way to cook a lobster is to put it in cold water and then warm it slowly. And the lobster doesn't realize that the water is warming slowly, and it just stays there uh, quietly until the water starts boiling, and then it will have a, a, a second of uh, right before death, and then it dies. It basically, you know, it's like uh, dying in a warm ba bath. Um, we're the lobster. We are the lobster in cold water, and we have to become the lobster that's dunked in hot water and actually realize, oh, hello, here's a, here's a change. That's the difference, right? Uh, we are the hot lobster in cold water, and the water is warming slowly, and because it's warming slowly, we don't realize that it is warming. We don't realize that the changes are happening. We just adapt because that's what humans do, what, what anim all animals do. We just adapt and say, yeah, okay, I have to worry about work. I'm going to start the AC in the car. The, the seat is very hot, but I'm going, I have an app on my phone and I can start the AC remotely and the car is going to be just cool and nice when I get in. Yeah, and you know, we all have our, I, I can control the temperature in my house from my phone as well. And, uh, you know, and we just adapt. And we're not realizing that, in fact, what that's doing is um, kind of putting blinders on. Uh, in, in Italian, they say, uh, in southern Italy, where I grew up, they say you put salami on your face, uh, you know, salami slices on your face, and you can't really see what's happening. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, for example, as we adapt to this uh, by using air conditioning, like you said, we are actually making the problem worse because air conditioning uses a lot of energy, particularly in houses. And many, many uh, places in the world, most of the world is still not air conditioned. Uh, Southeast Asia has no air conditioning. I India has very little air conditioning. Uh, China is rising in air conditioning. Uh, Europe, I grew up in Europe, we didn't have air conditioning. We started having it at, like way after I moved away after 2000. Um, as we use more air conditioning, not only are we pumping hot air out into the atmosphere, creating what is known as a heat island effect, which is why cities are hotter than uh, than areas in the in the woods, but we're also using more energy. As we use more energy, most of that energy comes from fossil fuels, which means more carbon emissions. So we're actually creating a, a vicious cycle, right? A vicious circle where. Uh, it's getting warmer because of what we're doing. So we use air conditioning, we use more energy, more energy produces more CO2, more carbon emissions, the carbon emissions make it warmer. Um, which is why, for example, I work with Daniel's Family Sustainable Energy Foundation uh, to find uh, solutions that can be applied to existing buildings that do not require additional energy, but do reflect more uh, sunlight uh, and uh, reflect heat uh, okay. in such a way that uh, buildings can be cooler uh, without having to use uh, energy to do so. We'll, we'll get to that. I'm very passionate about uh, passive houses and uh, near zero em uh, emission buildings. But before that, I've been reading something from what you were, uh, I, I, I think I've read it on your Instagram, Nature of Alex. Uh, you've, you've been telling, uh, you've been writing about how the ocean absorbs 80% of all the heat. Is that real? 96% actually. The, the ocean is going to suck the energy for us. The heat is going to be sucked into the ocean and we, we, we're good. Well, uh, not so much, unfortunately, uh, because uh, as the ocean absorbs more heat, it also creates um, some more um, uh, climate extremes, like, for example, hurricanes that we were discussing earlier. That's uh, er, The ocean is where hurricanes are born. And I'm going to show you the animation here if it actually uh, works. Okay, so here you can see... A sliver that's ice that's uh the percentage of heat that goes into ice uh that's uh land how much heat uh, is absorbed by land and that is the atmosphere the purple is the atmosphere the violet and that's you know when you go outside and say oh my god it's really hot day today that's what you're feeling it's the the purple uh the violet okay right? um this is how much heat goes into the deep ocean and this is how much heat goes into the upper ocean, the upper 200 meters of ocean. That's 63%, that's 
and that's six no percent, and you live there. Uh, this data is not mine. It's the International Panel on Climate Change. So this is the United Nations uh, Panel on Climate Change. It's not just some scientists uh, that uh, got together to this do is, some animations. The, the, the International Panel on Climate Change, the way it works, it is a group of, of scientists, uh, of hundreds of scientists, who review data from all over the world, from all sorts of studies. And then they pick whatever data they can really agree on and if you have ever hung out with scientists, you will find that uh, if you have three scientists in a room, you're going to have five opinions. Uh, so to tell you that they actually agreed on that and that data or the International Panel on Climate Change agreed on certain data is to say that they found the most conservative, most reliable bottom line, the bo most reliable conclusion they could find. And that's okay. what you just saw about oceans. What does this mean in terms of, you know, I said that I like graphs, but uh, people, not everybody likes graphs. So let me show you what this looks like in reality. Uh, what does this do? Uh, this is a scientific article published by uh, my colleague Andrew Pershing in Science Magazine, which is one of the top journals in the world. And you can see that the Northeastern United States here particularly are heating faster than most other places on Earth. Uh, the ocean is eating faster than most other places on Earth. What does that mean? What does that do in your life? Uh, how does that matter in my life? Well, uh, beaches have become completely invaded by uh, uh, seaweed that actually isn't from here. It's not from uh, this area. And this seaweed comes from tankers, from ships coming from, the, from Japan, which uh, wash their tanks in Japanese waters, then they carry whatever is in their tanks back to North, North Atlantic, and then they wash their tanks again. And, you know, the algae, the, the, the seaweed ends up in, in the North Atlantic. Here it is. It's called the Derosifonia japonica. It's a type of seaweed that uh, loves the temperature of the ocean as it is right now, as it is warming right now in North America. This is what it looks like. Right, and uh, uh, it covers everything underwater. If you have any fish, if you have a fishery, if you have uh, lobsters, uh, you will see um, the fish being suffocated, particularly lobsters that live under uh, this, uh, this, you know, on the, on the floor, they're bottom feeders, like uh, many other fish. Uh, so you see it everywhere, you see it in, uh, on beaches, it smells uh, and it affects uh, um, the livelihood of fishermen who uh, rely on lobster uh, or other fish to make a living. And this is happening all over the world, uh, including uh, the, the Mediterranean, I'll show you the Mediterranean in a minute, but also uh, the Great Barrier Reef, which is the most biodiverse place in the world. Uh, I actually went there before the last great um, uh, heat wave underwater. There, there are heat waves underwater as well. And uh, you could see a luscious, beautiful place. And then also uh, the, the coral started, um, uh, you know, where, where it starts bleaching. And after I went, because I knew I expected that there would be uh, a heat wave in 2016, this is what the same place looked like just a year later. The temperature difference was it to one degree or, or it was two or three degrees. It was enormous. Two or three. I don't recall exactly here. You actually see the heat. Uh, this is in degrees and uh, uh, it reached as much as 14 degrees where I was, uh, which is up there. So up here is where the heat reached 14 degrees. This is where the most coral loss occurred, where the coral uh, was um, devastated essentially. And this is also from science. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's peer reviewed, uh, actually nature, sorry, nature 2018. Um, so that's how it affects uh, the ocean. And when you have no coral, you have fewer fish, you have no top predators, and that affects uh, the way that uh, people live in those areas. This is a $6 billion tourist industry per year that is going the way of the dodo uh, to make a poor joke. That is, it's going uh, extinct. 
Uh, if you want to look at this in uh, what's happening in the Mediterranean, I can show you very quickly. You wanted to see Climate Reanalyzer, so let's do that. In the meanwhile, I'm going to tell people about uh, Climate Reanalyzer. I'm going to add the link in the description so people can browse for themselves for uh, big data on uh, climate change and uh, uh, warm up. Climate Reanalyzer is a tool made by the Climate Change Institute at the University of Maine, which uh, is one of my... Uh, 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 jobs <laughs> and uh, uh, it's done it, it's been created by Sean Burkle uh, with many Dr. Sean Burkle with many with help from uh, many uh, uh, of our scientists particularly Paul Majewski Andrei Kurbatov uh, again both of the Climate Change Institute and by going this is just today's weather maps if you want to see what uh, today's uh, summaries are for temperature and you can click on the uh, globe to change the view of the geographic coverage. And here you can see the average temperature as well as the maximum temperatures that for today in Europe. And the white is ab above 50 degrees. And the, the, the you know, dark red is uh, 40 degrees uh, Celsius and so on. Uh, and you can see it for the entire world. You can see it for South America. You can see it for Antarctica and North America. We are currently in a uh, a heat wave in North America, particularly for the Northwestern United States, which have never experienced temperatures in the 50s, and now they, they have. This is, this is absolutely insane. Canada. Canada is facing a heat wave and people are dying. Uh, the number of uh, daily deaths is doubled from a normal summer day. Absolutely, yeah, and uh, also North, you know, uh, Washington State and Oregon and California are also, uh, and Southern California particularly. Let's look at this. I mean, this is absolutely insane. And uh, another map that I like to look at is the sea surface temperature anomaly. That is, how much hotter is it in on the ocean than normal from uh, an average. From an average, and here you can see that again, the northeastern United States very, very hot. Really, what the white, the hottest part of the ocean right now, uh, that is really becoming uh, uh, a problem, just like Andrew Pershing exper uh, expected in 2015 with with his article that I just showed you. Uh, just that plat pattern continues in the Gulf of Maine, but the Mediterranean isn't looking so good either. Look at that. It's a hot soup. So you can see that it is a hot soup. It's becoming a tropical ocean, a tropical sea. And the same goes for the Black Sea and the Caspian. And the same goes for the North Sea. We've seen uh, some sort of algaes and uh, the Black Sea is changing color lately and all kind of uh, difference in uh, how the, the fish uh, are, are going and everything. So uh, yeah, it's crazy. It's it's crazy, and you can see. I mean, I mean, you can see sea ice. Uh, it, it is absolutely beautiful uh, to to show. And again, people people need to see beautiful things, even if the message is uh, not beautiful. You know, it's it's something that we're worried about. People need to see beautiful things to be to to be uh, thinking about uh, what's happening and. Uh, you can see it in a map like this, or uh, and, and we also have other displays. But uh, one of the things you can do with Climate Reanalyzer, what we just saw is weather, uh, weather maps. Weather is what happens on a day. Climate is a, a trend over time, right? Change over time. Uh, you can actually have monthly uh, weather, uh, I'm sorry, monthly climate uh, um, uh, uh, time series. And you can see how uh, data changes over time. You can change the uh, the area of the world uh, that this is for. Uh, and you can also, uh, I have monthly reanalysis maps. Here you can choose any area of the world. Let's choose Europe. And you can create a anomaly map by comparing, for example, uh, 2012, which was a very hot year, uh, compared to, say, uh, 1960 to 1970, which is an average uh, 40 years earlier, right? And I make a contour plot, plot because it's pretty, and uh, you plot it, and here is you, you have the anomaly. Look at Romania. We are inside of the anomaly right now. Right. So this is for 2012. We can try and, uh, and do 2020 for last year, also the hottest year on record. Look at that. 
So if that doesn't <laughs> alarm you, uh, and of course you're looking at Europe and you're looking at, you know, plus three, three degrees change already in, in this area. Uh, but if I show you the Arctic, you'll really be scared. Uh, I mean, the Arctic is the problem because that's, that's, that's where we are. Okay. For 2020. That's so that we are off the charts, quite literally. It's time to get real about it. So now we, we've shown the dead data. Uh, you, we've got the climate scientists uh, putting it out there. It's for real. We know it. It's undoubtedly happening. Right. What do we do about it? Because people, like you said, have a short memory. So what do we do in the next 20 years before we lose track again? And we all become, I don't know, Bedouins. We're going to wear uh, things on our heads just to stay uh, safe from the sun. Yeah, I mean, the first thing that we have to realize is that uh, um, it, it, there are no short uh, technological answers that are going to solve the entire problem. Uh, of course. You'll hear a lot of uh, people talk about geoengineering, if, for example, which basically means uh, changing the atmosphere and changing the world uh, with, uh, uh, with human intervention. So one of the ge geoengineering uh, options that have been suggested is to spray sulfuric acid in the atmosphere with planes constantly. Why sulfuric acid? Because that's what uh, happens with eruptions. When eruptions happen, you have a lot of dust and uh, sulfuric acid out of aerosols in the, in the atmosphere and that they reflect sunlight better than uh, um, to more effectively. Uh, lowering the temperature. If you were around in 2010 and you remember the... Fiat la Yokul. Wow. Okay. I'm beaten. Wow. My it's one friend. of the things I got right about that. So. All right. That's amazing. Uh, yeah. So if you remember what happened then, you remember the temperature dropped and airlines had to stop uh, flying because of um, what the... Uh, a fairly, relatively small eruption compared to major eruptions. Of course. Did. So geoengineering suggests a technological answer that basically would recreate that type of event uh, by spraying those aerosols, particularly sulfuric acid, in the, uh, in the air. And you'd have to do that constantly in order to lower the temperature all throughout the world. That's not only unfeasible. Uh, we have already done that. We have already know. We already know what that does. Yes, it lowers the temperature. But you know what else you get? Sulfuric acid uh, creating acid rain. So you go from a climate crisis into an agricultural crisis where all land is going to cover be covered in uh, acid rain, and you're going to have uh, uh, famines. So that's that's uh, also, by the way, uh, the uh, acid, the uh, sulfuric acid does not stay where you spray it. It moves with the wind, with with the atmosphere. And currently, we have also a crisis of ocean acidification. That is, the ocean becoming more acidic due to CO two uh, going into the ocean. Just like we we make Coca Cola, we spray CO two into the liquid, right? Well, we have a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere and it's going into the ocean. It's making it more acidic. That's why if you put a rusty nail in Coca-Cola, it, it dissolves. Uh, same thing. Uh, and that's dissolving coral. So you'd have more ocean acidification, you'd have more, more uh, acid rain. Not a good idea. So we, we cannot geoengineer it, yeah? It, geoengineering is out of... We cannot... Uh, you use a, like a magic umbrella on top of the planet, it's impossible. That's not going to solve the problem. There are also other solutions that have been uh, provided. Um, I, uh, you know, uh, electrification, that is the switch uh, of all houses, all consumption to electrical, uh, so that you can actually concentrate the problem only at the source, right? So you don't want to convert each house to generate its own power, for example, oil, coal, wood, uh, whatever it is that you use in order to produce your own heat or cooling, but rather uh, connect, just connect the house to a central power station, which many, many, many houses are not connected or they're not uh, using the power electricity for heat or for, uh, for cooling. Uh, but if you just connect all the houses and, and make them entirely reliant on uh, on a power 
station, then that power station can be converted to some form of renewable energy, say wind or solar. Is that a solution? Are, are renewables a real solution? That's definitely part of the solution. But remember that due to the fact that we have seven and a half billion of us on this planet, yeah. any solution that we propose is going to have its own problems. Because anything you do, what we say in environmental health, what's the rule of environmental health? Don't do too much of anything. That's the, that's the rule, right? Don't eat okay. too much fish. Don't, don't, don't stay in the sun too much, et cetera, et cetera. So um, if you scale uh, the electrification to 8.5 billion people, you're going to have other problems. How do you store the power, for example? That's the main problem. Now we're using lithium batteries, where lithium is very... Uh, is, is mined in South America, now also in the southwestern United States, uh, in very damaging ways. It's destroying ecosystems. So the assumption that we actually have to continue life as it is, uh, being very wasteful with our power, very wasteful with the way we live, that's the challenge that we really have to uh, uh, face. We have to change how wasteful we are and uh, how, where we get our energy and how we store our energy. Uh, we might so, have to start thinking about just using energy during the day when it's available from solar power. And like many people used to, not even 70, 80 years ago. Uh, you know, not okay. everybody had electricity and everybody just had uh, whatever light there was from uh, either sun or, uh, or, um, or wind power. Uh, that's just, a, that, that's just a, a, a change in our culture, which will not take... Uh, an enormous effort uh, in many ways if we all switch to public transportation if we all fly less uh, nobody said that you have to fly across the world to give a powerpoint presentation the pandemic showed that um, so those are the the changes that we have to make in order to to make the scale of the problem less impactful on the environment because as i said whatever solution we find it's going to have its own problem problems uh, because 8.5 billion people doing the same thing is going to necessarily affect uh, okay. it's called an economy of scale right so let's let's go into renewables a little and uh, um, electric transportation and uh, housing passive and near zero uh, how do you see all that because we still need to live 80% uh, of the time we are indoors uh, so we need uh, proper housing, we need uh, fresh air, we need decent temperature. So uh, at this time, it's 37 Celsius outside. I would be sweating if I didn't turn on the, the AC in here to talk to you. Absolutely. Uh, so one of the things that uh, we don't realize is that with few exceptions, with few uh, countries and few uh, real attempts, at uh, systemic change, our uh, building construction, the way that we build houses, the way we insulate them, and the way we heat them and cool them is uh, almost uh, 200 years old by technology, by scientific standards. There are ways to build passive houses that are essentially carbon neutral or negative. That is, they don't produce emissions. They don't. They don't use enough power to produce emissions. Uh, there are ways to create. Uh, uh, so, for example, there are products like heat abatement technology, which has been patented by the Daniels Family Sustainable Energy Foundation and its uh, uh, arm, the TMX Technologies, which essentially uh, have produced a coating, um, kind of like a gel. Uh, uh, surface that you put on top of existing surfaces, roofs and houses, which reduces heat absorption uh, from the sun up to 30%. Have you ever noticed that most uh, uh, roofs in uh, uh, Europe, as well as particularly in the United States, are not white and they don't uh, reflect uh, uh, sunlight? Well, not only can you reflect more sunlight if, you, if your roofs are a uh, different color, uh, that is white, which it reflects the most. But you can also reflect it on a nanoscale, which is what the Daniels family, this invention that they patented, basically uh, reflects light on a nanoscale, just like sulfuric acid, just like other, okay. other chemicals can reflect more sunlight uh, during a, a volcanic eruption. You can do the same on a nanoscale uh, on, uh, uh, for, for surfaces. 
Uh, so not only the color, but also the structure of on a nanoscale of those surfaces can reflect more light, uh, okay. kind of like aligning mirrors uh, against the sun. If you if you want to think uh, think of it uh, okay. more without getting into the physics of it, an up to thirty percent reduction in heat absorption is enormous. It's an enormous uh, advantage, and that uh, I think is you know. Uh, that's bringing science into a fairly science uh, deprived industry uh, in building. Again, there are many, many exceptions, excellent exceptions. The powerhouse in uh, Norway, for example, uh, uh, is one example of this, which is uh, an ex excellent uh, example of uh, passive housing. And there are many other innovations uh, like very good ventilation and uh, uh, efficient ventilation that is and um, uh, cooling uh, geothermal energy for those places that actually need heating. Uh, all of those, uh, in addition to solar and wind, uh, implemented in a way locally and on a regional level that can that, that have the least impact on, on the environment, but also the highest efficiency for those who use them. We have to bring science essentially into buildings and into transportation, like you said. And I think transportation, public transportation, is probably easier a, pro a problem, an easier problem to solve. Uh, personal transportation, like electric cars, more problematic uh, because uh, the batteries that we're producing are based on a, on finite, on on limited resources, lithium particularly, which is not uh, not infinite. It comes from mines, uh, just like coal came from mines. And these mines are usually in areas of the world that are being exploited. Uh, Bolivia is the Saudi Arabia of lithium, for example, and uh, uh, the southeastern United, southwestern United States is uh, another area uh, in indigenous uh, Native American land. What do I do, Alex? Should I should I not buy an electric car because it's uh, it, it has lithium batteries? What should I drive? Uh, I'd say take the train as much as you can. <laughs> I don't have a train in my area uh, and uh, the bike is not feasible when you have a child to take to school and all that. So oh. we're going to have to adapt and, you know, uh, some level of electric transportation is going to be part of uh, the solution until we find better batteries, better uh, technologies. Okay. I know that many of the companies uh, currently producing car electric cars are striving to find better uh, batteries. One of the reasons that a major uh, the major uh, car companies that have not yet produced electric vehicles haven't done so is that they want more efficient batteries that can't be recycled, that aren't going to create another environmental of uh, problem by uh, not only mining it, but also how are you going to recycle it? Well, for the time being, we, we are not recycling too much because they are being reused as uh, house batteries. So. Uh power walls, let's say. Uh, most of the electric cars that are damaged in accidents or, I don't know, uh, because they don't really die, they just get destroyed. Uh, the batteries are being reused for home purposes. So this is a good thing, but I'm still, I still feel uh, uh, a responsibility for the lithium in my electric car. At least I'm not bringing smoke and particles into the city. What does op optimistic mean? It doesn't mean that I'm not a realist. It means simply that uh, I've seen, I've studied enough of human history uh, and climate history to know that we have faced crises and uh, have found solutions. Uh, you can see, for example, one of the best, perhaps one of the best examples of this is the ozone hole, uh, which was produced by CFC chlorofluorocarbons. And, uh, you know, uh, the whole world came together. The Montreal Protocol was produced and you and chlorofluorocarbons were banned uh, worldwide. We found other other solutions. This is a harder problem. Energy uh, and uh, uh, batteries are a harder problem to solve. But why can't we uh, uh, try and find better solutions? Better, the biggest battery in the world uh, is an artificial battery where water uh, is uh, uh, collected at a, uh, in a large basin in a large uh, environment. And then whenever it is needed, the, the water is let through a dynamo and it creates uh, 
uh, it creates electricity. Uh, so hydroelectric is definitely uh, uh, one of the many uh, solutions, as long as it's not environmentally uh, uh, negative for, for uh, you know, one of the major hydroelectric plants in, Nor in North America is just a few miles from where I'm sitting in uh, Lowell, Massachusetts. It's been around since uh, uh, the 1800s, and it has a fish elevator that brings fish across. Uh, oh, that's one. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you were there. You were, you were there. Yeah, you, it, you, that's that, that was meet, so cool to see a fish elevator. Precisely. And, you know, that's been around for a long time. The, the environment has not been uh, changed radically uh and uh at least for now until we find better solutions uh that is the least intrusive we can be into the environment okay. but again so I, I have to say we have to basically think about scaling down our wasteful consumption that's the that, it's not just turning off a, a light bulb or you know installing an led bulb which everybody should uh but it's also thinking about how we work do we work from home or do we take the car to go someplace to, to work? Is that really necessary? Uh, do we have to travel across the globe on a plane in order Even to give a presentation? Even though you can afford it, you should uh, yeah. think twice about it. Yeah. If you can afford it, you should not uh, Just because you do can it. doesn't mean you have to. Exactly. Yeah. So this is very hard to explain to my fellow Romanians that have uh, come up from communism. Where of the, course. When we didn't have any. And now they're looking uh, abroad and saying, oh, yeah, but the Americans can say that because they've been uh, thriving for the past, I don't know, 200 years. And that's years. what everybody going says. through communism. Uh, that's what everybody says. And, and you know, it's, uh, it's a very, I mean, they're right, right? They're, they're, you know, we produce the science that says, oh, I'm sorry, you developing world don't develop anymore. We have developed, but you don't have the right to do so because we are heating the planet. And they're, they're obviously going to say, mm, okay, well, why am I paying for your problem? Uh, and why are you limiting my development, my standard of living because of a problem you caused? Uh, and they're not wrong. I mean, everybody has a right to clean water and a uh, shelter and, uh, and life at a decent standard And the low-cost standard flight to the other end of the continent to have a, a, a city break in Barcelona for yeah. 19 euros. I'm not so concerned about the once a year, oh, okay, I'm going to Barcelona for a weekend. What I'm concerned about is the fact that there are entire businesses like consulting, uh, like uh, even just, uh, uh, you know, management of business where people used to, I I'm not kidding, this to Europeans sounds insane. Uh, I know it did for me, but they used, they, they basically, get up uh, on a mon Monday morning at 6 a.m., get on a plane, go to a job site somewhere across the country or across the world and stay there for four days and then they come back on a plane on, a, on, on Thursday night, go to the office on Friday, and then they have the weekend off. They do that every week. Why? Or even worse, I, I've met people that have been abroad most of the time and uh, flying almost uh, every other day. So... Uh, it's it's a way of doing business and, and you know it's all you can't do certain things uh, in person you know uh by zoom that you can't do uh in person okay well then move there uh or you know uh find another solution but that that should not be allowed uh it, it just we you know we we have to have a limited number of uh, kilograms of, of carbon that we produce by just being alive, which is one of the reasons why oh, I propose. I, I like that. I would vote for that. Yeah, uh, it's one of the reasons why I propose putting a carbon footprint on every product. Uh, so, you know, you have your your pills and, uh, you know, on your you, you get your uh, nutrition facts or whatever it is, you know, what what, what does this contain today? We we buy food and it says it contains this much sodium, this much fat, this much carbohydrate. Well, why not have also this much methane, this much CO2 produced, used to produce this? Uh, that would be good. And why not have a personal carbon footprint calculated every time you go to the grocery store, every time you buy something? That would be crazy because we are consuming much more plastic than food these days. You know why plastic is so cheap? Why we're producing so much plastic? No. It's because in, the, in Europe it's uh, subsidized by the tune of 300 billion euros and in the United States it's subsidized 
by the tune of 200 million billion uh, dollars and that money goes to oil subsidies oil and and that's where plastic comes from this is why virgin plastic single-use plastic plastic that you use only once is much cheaper than recycled plastic because if we if we subsidize the cost of oil to that level you're never going to make recycled plastic that's cheaper it's just impossible uh, the recycling process is just too expensive which is why only five to fifteen percent of plastic is actually recycled uh, the problem has to be stopped at the source uh, there is no reason to subsidize give money free money subsidize meaning taking your tax dollars or euros and sending them to the most polluting companies that are uh, using a uh, obsolete uh, and and uh, destructive technology uh, of course in your air uh, you know just giving the money away and that's why you find plastic in the ocean that's why you or anywhere not else. only not only we are being flooded by containers coming from all over Europe with uh, uh, with trash being poor also mean uh, being more polluted and uh, getting more trash from the developed world so uh, climate change is only one side of things it also ripples into many many other areas but still I'm talking to the people that are willing to listen if they're here after almost an hour and a half let's do a summary for whoever wants to listen if you really want to be here or your children uh, to live uh, in a in in a world that resembles the present you, you should use less more efficient just be more efficient don't be wasteful uh and uh, uh you know look this is what everybody actually wants to do already uh one of the statistics which has made all business uh all throughout the world switch to sustainability which is the big hot word these days uh now everybody has the sustainability director and a sustainability policy and a green policy right of course uh the one statistic that has made everybody switch and pay so much money invest so much money in sustainability is that given two products uh at the same price point at the same cost people will always choose this the sustainable product 85 percent of the time right okay. so if i if i have a uh, uh i don't know a an apple that's produced sustainably and an apple that's produced unsustainably uh say with lots of pesticides and lots of uh, artificial fertilizers uh people will always choose 85 percent of the time will choose the apple that's produced sustainably even if at the same price point and sometimes even if the the apple that's sustainable uh costs a little more that is called uh market share that is how you gain market share this has never been true in american economic history and i don't know about european history but i don't think so either generally people who bought a certain brand always stuck to that brand if you wear uh opel or uh, volkswagen or a mercedes person you'd always stay a mercedes person provided you have the money for it uh now people are switching to other brands if they're more sustainable 85 percent of the time and that wow. means that you are yeah that means that it is the best incentive for businesses to uh switch to sustainable non-wasteful efficient uh, uh policy because that's how you get over how you remove the largest the biggest obstacle to making it big in business right which is the biggest barrier of entry what is it it's market share how do you gain okay. market share so it's also a great business idea and for the average uh, for the average person use less uh, be less wasteful uh, mind your consumption wherever you are at home uh, in your business and mind what you eat uh, look into your plate and see if you really need all that beef i mean and, and we're not such offenders in europe that we eat beef uh every day uh or every other day in america and australia brazil uh those are the major offenders where a lot of beef uh and i can't i mean first of all it's bad for you uh it, it's been associated with cancer it's been associated with it, it is uh the cause of cardiovascular disease which is number one killer in the united states uh and uh, uh so beef is destructive it's really one of the most destructive industries on the planet uh it is destroying forests 
because you need cat, uh, soy and, and, and grass to grow the cattle, to grow the cows. And, and it is enormously cruel if you care about uh, animals at all. If you, I swear to God, if you see a, a slaughterhouse, you will not eat beef ever again. Uh, and pork, uh, as you know, pork pigs is, are, are not very different. Uh, chicken are a little lower carbon footprint. Turkey is a little lower carbon footprint. I'm not telling you to turn totally vegetarian, although you can. Uh, but I know that in a lot of places that's not an option. I grew up in southern Italy and Greece. Going vegetarian would be impossible in many cases. I was really, really skinny. You're not skinny. You're, not, you're a diver. You need your energy. You're going underwater almost every other day. My grandma almost kicked me out of my uh, of the house when I uh, when uh, I was fainting because I want I didn't want to eat beef or uh, you either start eating some chicken or uh, you know this is the end of it. And so I'm not asking people. I'm not saying that people should make enormous sacrifices and change their lives entirely. I'm just saying make the healthy choice for your. Uh, diet for your health, which often is the healthy choice for the environment. Okay, but get ready for the near future when you'll see more and more extreme weather events uh, and uh, uh, the next pandemic will not wait for another hundred years. We don't think so, no. Uh, we, I'm actually in the process of uh, uh, creating a group uh, that uh, will be looking at the next uh, uh, emerging diseases and uh, that have the potential of becoming pandemics and how they're related to climate. And we're going to use past examples to do this, as I have, and then um, you know predict what the ri risk areas are, and uh, or at least you know list what the risk factors are uh in order because that's 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 going to be the next uh, nobody wants to go through another pandemic right uh, we all want to avoid that we are not out, out of the woods yet so uh, we're looking out for the delta variant and it's to avoid it many of the solutions for climate are also a solution for health that's what i'm trying to say uh if we okay. mitigate climate change if we have address climate change if we Re, we rewild or keep wild places that are wild. If we protect wilderness and animals have a place to be, uh, then the likelihood that those animals are going to come into our habitat, our uh, cities, uh, is lower. Okay. And uh, that is really important. Uh, it's an important point. I was just thinking we should buy more forests and uh, l lock them in. Land trusts are uh, definitely one of the main major solutions. Uh, I've worked with many uh, land trusts, uh, and uh, I live in a state in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that is uh, one of the most uh, uh, active at conserving land. Uh, so protecting land, creating national parks, uh, recreating, rewilding the national parks that we already have, reintroducing species that used to be there. Uh, for example, wolves in Yellowstone have uh, uh, changed the course of rivers. They have become, uh, they have recreated the wilderness that used to be there, including vegetation, because deer are fewer and they eat less, they behave differently. And so you need wolves to protect vegetation. Yes, absolutely. Mind blowing. Uh, mind blowing, but that's what it is. And, you know, there are zero uh, cases of wolves attacks on humans that are documented. They do take the occasional sheep. They do take the occasional uh, uh, animal. We can work against that. We can find solutions to that. Uh, but there is no reason to go and, and kill uh, thousands of wolves as they're planning to do uh, in the northwestern United States uh, because it's been authorized in the last couple of months. This is what they've done. Uh, they've done in Europe for the past uh, hun uh, hundred years, and now the only place we got, we still got wolves and bears is Romania. So, yeah, are, Romania okay. is the perfect example of what you should be doing. Well, not necessarily because Romanians are saying, "Yeah, okay, but why don't you get get some, uh, put uh, put some bears and wolves uh, in your forests and your mountains? Why why let us do uh, do it all? Why don't you do it? Come on, Swiss people, come on, French and uh, Germans. Yeah, send send them to the Black Forest. They don't want them. They should. They should get some the Black Forest and some black wolves. Yeah. That should work. Yeah, you know, we, we have coyotes here the size of wolves. Uh, they're called Eastern coyotes. They sometimes are improperly named coy wolves. They're more afraid of me than 
anything. I mean, I have seen them as only like a mile and a half away ever. They will not get close to you. And wolves, even in packs, never, uh, never seen behavior that, uh, in fact, you should avoid behavior that allows them to get close because they're just going to look for food. They're going to ask you for food. They're not going to actually jump you. Uh, there is no meat on these bones. They want a buffalo. They want a, a deer. There's nothing here. <laughs> it's like sharks. Oh, sharks are going to kill all. No, sharks give a bite, a test bite. They feel that it's bony, and they're like, ah, this is not a seal. Yeah. You're going to bleed to death, but uh, uh, it's not because they want to kill you. It's because they're hungry, and you look like a seal. You've been telling me sharks are getting more, uh, higher and higher also in your waters. You, you didn't used to have sharks uh, where you dive. I was a just discuss back. discussing this with a captain friend of mine uh, this morning. We have to um, uh, be precise about when. Uh, in uh, the northeastern United States, they had a uh, uh, a seal uh, head hunting policy for many years. So until 1967, all seals. Uh, if you shot a seal, you could claim a reward with the state, of, with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and other uh, states also in the Northeast. So seals disappeared. Uh, they were almost hunted to extinction in the Northeast. And uh, because they ate fish. Yeah, yeah, because they, they were seen as competing with the fishermen. And today, still, there are people who say they compete with the fishermen. All scientists have found dead seals or uh, and opened their stomachs and they found no fish that people fish. Uh, it's actually totally different fish. Uh, okay. So it's actually not true. But uh, so, but if you read the classic of uh, that describes this area, for example, a classic book called The Othermost House, one of my favorite books ever, you'll see that he sees no seals. He describes a year on uh, in the wilderness of Cape Cod. He sees no seals, barely any. I was there... Uh, three weeks ago, I walked the beach and there was three or four seals following me all the way down uh, the beach for miles. L seals everywhere. And then Tucket has tons of seals. And seals are the favorite food of sh white sharks. Uh, okay. Were there white sharks? I was actually asking this question uh, this morning. Were there white sharks here before we killed all the seals? Uh, the answer is I simply don't know. I'm sure that somebody knows that question, that, that answer, but uh, like a good scientist, I'm going to plead ignorance when I'm ignorant, and I'm just going to say, okay. I don't know. Water is definitely getting warmer up here, as I showed you earlier. Lots of uh, uh, species are migrating north. Tuna have migrated north. Lobsters are migrating north. Um, and as a result, there is uh, less food uh, in the water, and we got to wonder what other fish are migrating north. If seals are, are more north than, than than south, and is that what the white sharks are doing? They're just following the, the seals. Uh, I'm not a marine biologist, uh, so I, I can't give that answer. But there are Andrew Pershing, uh, whose article I showed you earlier, made that case for cod. There's no more cod in, uh, in the Gulf of Maine. Why? Because the water is too hot. I'm worried now we might see uh, sharks uh, in the Black Sea or the Mediterranean, but I wouldn't go so far yet. If you ask my father, who is a Facebook aficionado, he'll tell you that there are sharks everywhere. And that's obviously because he gets the same stories, uh, you know, repeated through the algorithm. Every time he clicks on a shark story, you know, Facebook will give him 15 other shark stories. Uh, I personally have not heard that. The only place where I've heard that there has been an increase in shark attacks is Australia. Uh, okay. And I can see all sorts of reasons why that might be, again, related to the food supply. If there are if fish are migrating because the water is too hot uh, and then the sharks are left to eat whatever is available, uh, you know, they got to eat too. And if we're underwater, they're going to go for whatever is in the water. You're a diver and you do underwater photography. Uh, that's less than uh, one or two percent of all divers do. And uh, we love your photos. Uh, so uh, I'm going to ask my, uh, my viewers to go uh, ahead and follow you on your Instagram where you, you should post more often. I should say. I should post more often. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's been a busy year. Uh, because I am the person that's at the at the crossroads of the climate crisis and the health crisis together. So my posting has not been very, or my diving has not been very very frequent. Uh, okay. uh, but I have plenty of material. Uh, I need a, a, some social media assistant who can just 
you know, <laughs> put the stuff. Okay, <laughs> it's all on my put desktop. <laughs> So you got your all your photos. You you just need someone to post for you. Yeah, I've I've I got you know I've looked at automating and doing things, but it's just so much work. Uh, and I feel like well, okay, but I could write a grant or write an article, or I could post a picture. And you know the grants <laughs> of the article always went out because I have to. I have like it should. And, like yeah. it should. Uh, Alex, thank you so much for your time. I, we really appreciate it. Uh, I'm very thankful uh, for everything you've been uh, offering. I've learned new things today. And I think uh, it, it was a good day to learn some things. I'm a little more scared than I was before, even though I knew some. So I'm going to try and be more mindful uh, and less wasteful. Well, it's always better to know than not to know. I feel like, like when I know more, I'm less anxious. So you might be a little more scared, but you'll be less anxious uh, about what's okay. happening and you can plan better uh, for the future. And that's really the key. Because planning is key. Uh, we cannot live uh, the way we, uh, we, we are used to. Uh, the weather is changing, the world is changing and our, our houses and our way of living is not working anymore. It's simply not is. Thank you, Alex. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me, George. Take care.